right, hello everyone. Welcome to Bowdoin College and to the first common hour of our semester. My name is Katie Burns. I direct the Baldwin program in the Center for Learning and Teaching. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today. So I'm gonna give a few thanks and then tell you a little bit about her and then I'll let her take over. So I would like to thank the Center for Learning and Teaching, particularly Tamis Donovan, the Thrive Initiative led by Jessica Perez and our Senior VP for Diversity and Inclusion, Michael Reed, for co-sponsoring this event. I also wanna thank Michelle Morin, who is standing in the back from the events office for making this happen. The the AV techs who are up there, uh, the housekeepers and the student ushers for making this event possible. As we come together to learn from the wisdom and ex expertise of Dr. Laura Rendon about teaching and learning for wholeness and social change, I also want to honor the Wab Wabanaki land on which we stand where we are. Institutions of higher education were designed to be places for contemplation and dialogue. And Common Hour at Bowdoin College creates this opportunity to bring community members together to deepen our common understanding, address concerns, and I love this phrase, inspire delight. So our speaker today, Dr. Laura Rendon, is a professor emerita at the University of Texas in San Antonio. She is also an educational consultant and featured speaker at over 100 institutions of higher education and conferences throughout the nation. Her work focuses on topics such as student success, Latinx STEM students, and sensing thinking deep learning experiences, as well as self-care and healing. A native of Laredo, Texas, Dr. Rendon's passion is ensuring that the nation's educational system fosters success for all students, especially those who are low income and first generation. Dr. Rendon developed validation theory, which is an asset-based student success framework that has been employed to frame research studies and programmatic activities in two and four year colleges and universities. She is also a teaching learning theorist and thought leader. She is the author of this book right here, Senti Pensante, Sensing Thinking Pedagogy, Educating for Wholeness, Social Justice, and Liberation, as well as numerous publications focusing on student success and contemplative education. She is a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute, a member of the board of directors at the John N. Gardner Institute for Excellence in Undergraduate Education, and a former fellow of the Fetzer Institute. In 2013, the Texas Diversity Council awarded her the title of being one of the most powerful and influential women in Texas. Her personal archives are a part of the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at the University of Texas at Austin, one of the premier libraries in the world focused on Latin American and Latinx studies. I have admired and been inspired by her work for many years as a fellow contemplative scholar. Her writings and her presence stimulate my ways of knowing and understanding teaching and learning. In her book, she describes the core question guiding her inquiry as the following. What is the experience of creating a teaching and learning dream, a pedagogic vision based on wholeness and consonance, respecting the harmonious rhythm between the outer experience of intellectualism and rational analysis and the inner dimension of insight, emotion, and awareness? May we all experience and come to know an education that embraces and enhances our wholeness as human beings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Rendon to Bowdoin College. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be in Maine, my first time in Maine, so I'm enjoying it. And uh, I hear that this is the inaugural Common Hour Lecture at, at this hour, and so I'm honored to uh, really be a part of this and uh, to have the opportunity to, to share my work. So let me begin by saying a little bit about how I enter this inquiry. Um, I consider myself to be a nepantlera, which is a term coined by iconic feminist theorist uh, Gloria Anseldúa. And basically, um, a nepantlera is someone who is able to navigate liminal spaces, these in-between spaces of growth and innovation, where one finds herself uh, with one foot in one area and another foot in another, and you know, trying to navigate all of those. Um, we know the experience of moving fluidly among different borders 
and identities and ways of knowing. So I know what it is to be the other and to figuratively be uh, a border woman. Um, there are intersectional aspects of my identity. I've had the experience of being Mexican and American, of living in poverty and in affluence, of coming to terms both with oppression and privilege, and to be a member of the queer scholarly community centered on the edge of transforming the academy. So it's all of these identities and experiences that make me who I am, how I grow, uh, and you know, basically bring all of this to my work in the academy. So I want to discuss today what I mean by developing a contemplative pedagogy that is grounded in wholeness, in justice, and in equity. And essentially, this involves at least three things. One is to engage with equity and justice issues confronting society. Second, we need to connect and extend the contemplative education movement to include culturally diverse learners in low-income communities and schools. And third, it's a matter of designing a framework for contemplative pedagogy grounded in justice and equity and geared toward personal transformation and the creation of transformational changes in our society. So I come to this talk today knowing full well that we are dealing with some very, very difficult issues in our society. There's a lot of chaos in our world right now, not just in the US, things that have shaken us up. And um, what concerns me is what is the kind of education that we need to have to help our students who are going to be the leaders in addressing the issues I have here. And these are just some uh, justice uh, issues uh, confronting our society from climate change to immigration to um, you know, the crises and wars across the world, religious intolerance, uh, poverty, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, women's rights and the Me Too movement, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what we need is an education that I believe is transformative in nature and that really is going to foster in our students the kind of knowledge and wisdom needed to help us to deal with these kinds of issues. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? Uh, but I would like to know that we're going to be in good hands because we have created a transformational education that is going to create in students the idea that they can work with both knowledge and wisdom as they approach the solution of some of these issues. So contemplative education, I believe, needs to also be brought to culturally diverse learners and communities and to think about what the field of contemplative education can offer to students who have been oppressed, many who live in the shadows of our society, students who don't sometimes have a stable home environment, students who have been invalidated, who've been told you're not going to amount to nothing, you're not smart, you don't belong in college, students who have been treated as the other, students of color, undocumented students, low-income students, GLBT students, Q students, disabled students, religious minorities, and others. And understand, however, that people of color have always had their own forms of contemplative practice. It's not like contemplative education is something that is all that new to them. Their contemplative traditions, for example, in my culture, uh, in the Hispanic culture, of prayer, 
uh, of um, retreats, of uh, healing, um, and all of those are important. We have had these, and the emerging contemplative education movement that is um, taking shape right now and is, is, is moving forward and is being reshaped as it moves, um, often there, there's talk that, that this movement has not really reached um, low-income students, and I think that they need to be a part of this kind of education as well. And we need to also consider that we have our students who want to have an education where they can find deeper meaning in what they are learning, both in and out of the classroom, and students who want to have a clear sense of purpose. So let me begin then with a framework for connecting equity and justice with the field of contemplative education. And I think we need to pay attention to at least four things. One is a pedagogic framework rooted in justice and equity frameworks. Secondly, attention to learning objectives. Third, pedagogic tools and practices that we're going to employ. And fourth, the concern with the kinds of outcomes that we wish to see as a result of our teaching and learning. So adding more detail to that framework, um, we go back then to the pedagogic framework, which basically means as faculty stepping into the classroom where we know we're going to have a diverse student body more and more. Uh, some of these students are the first in their family to attend college. Some of them are low income. And so what is the lens we're going to use as we step into that classroom? Uh, there are many frameworks right now that we can select from, for example, intersectionality, anti-oppression pedagogy, Chikina, Chicana, Latina, Latina feminisms, feminist pedagogy, anti-oppression pedagogy, critical indigenous pedagogy. What is it, in other words, that frames our thinking about teaching and learning? What is our philosophical orientation to teaching and learning? And then the learning objectives, which would be, in this case, holistic, addressing both academic and inner skill, inner life development, and those that are equity and justice focused. And then attention to the pedagogic tools that we're going to use. This would include culturally validating contemplative practices and practices that foster deep learning and academic rigor as well. And then looking at the student outcomes, both intellectual, social, emotional learning, and justice and equity uh, outcomes. So that's the framework. Um, let me give you an example. Let's suppose that you're interested in intersectionality, and uh, many of you know that Kimberly Williams Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality. And really it was uh, feminists of color and activists who were the, among the first to address issues of intersectionality. And um, the authors of a groundbreaking book called This Bridge Called My Back, edited by Sheree Moraga and Gloria Saldua, introduced for the very first time issues of race, class, and sexuality within the feminist debate. So in other words, it's not enough to think about a framework that is based on women alone, because women are not just women. Uh, you know, there's, for example, myself, you know, I mean, you also need to consider race, you need to consider uh, sexuality, you need to consider religious beliefs, all of the different identities that constitute what it is to be a woman. So that's the theory of intersectionality. So why be concerned with intersectionality? <clears throat> why ask students to consider the privileged and the non-privileged aspects of their identity? Well, first, because learners need a theoretical anchor which they can, with which they can face themselves in all of their complexities. They also need an anchor with which they can face humanity in all of our complexities. And learners should be able to see how they fluidly navigate liminal spaces, 
diverse identities, and ways of knowing. Here's another pedagogic framework uh, that basically constitutes some of what I use at times, and it's based on Chicana Latina feminisms that include um, a political dimension that resists all forms of oppression. It's multi-perspectival, uses diverse methods and theories. It's focused on social justice, concerned with the historical experiences of Mexican women. It's transnational. It includes Latinas and other nationalities beyond the US. And it disrupts the notion that Chicana Latina identity is monolithic and homogeneous and it is liberatory in nature. So part of this Latina feminist framework includes the work of feminist theorist Gloria Ansaldúa, who talks about a term she calls conocimiento, conocimiento. And conocimiento is really a high level of enlightenment and self-understanding. Uh, it allows for these aha moments that awaken us from, you know, sometimes a trance that we don't, we, can, we have blinders on and all of a sudden, oh, this is what is meant by this. It's liberatory in nature. Uh, it allows us to work within and outside of the system. And it questions conventional knowledges, current categories, classifications, and contexts. So, there is room to consider, for example, the notion of, of gender fluidity, of intersectional aspects of our identity, and it breaks down binaries. To access conocimiento, this high level of enlightenment, Asaldúa proposes that we use the creative arts. Arts such as writing, art making, dancing, healing, teaching, meditation, and spiritual activism. For Ansaldúa, um, all of this conocimiento comes from opening our senses and that as we do this inner work of self, it helps us to engage with our public acts. In terms of student outcomes, there are so many, but let me just highlight a few. Uh, for this transformed vision of education, uh, we need, of course, intellectual outcomes. We need our students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers and to know the content. But we also want them to know other things, such as um, deep self-knowledge, the understanding of oneself, our strengths, our limitations, empathy, putting ourselves in the shoes of the other, appreciating and working with diversity, Pluriversality, this whole notion that we can work with contradictions. Uh, Self-care, healing, and well-being. A sense of connectedness to the other. And a sense of meaning and purpose. These are just some examples of the student outcomes we would want to see. In writing the book, Senti Pensante Pedagogy, I started with a question uh, that grounded what I was looking for in my inquiry. And that question was, what is the experience of working with an integrative, non-dual, consonant pedagogy in higher education? I was looking for faculty that actually believe in what I'm talking about, who were looking for a deeper way of working with teaching and learning in the classroom. They wanted to see very intelligent students, but they also wanted to see students that could work with others. They also wanted to see students that could work with equity and justice issues. They also wanted to see students who had empathy and compassion. They also wanted to see students who wanted to give back to make this place a better world to live. So what, what is this like to be able to address all of those holistic kinds of uh, learning experiences in the classroom. Um, and so I interviewed um, these faculty members um, in diverse disciplines, and they were in two and four year institutions. Uh, and so you see that also I made an effort to uh, have some diversity within that sample. And I interviewed them for one or two, uh, from one to two hours each. 
Uh, and I also interviewed 23 of their students in a, in a focus group setting. So what did I learn from all of that? I learned that these faculty members use what I'm now calling estrategias de conocimiento, enlightenment strategies or contemplative tools grounded in wholeness, in justice, and in equity. So I want to give you some examples of the faculty that I interviewed and what they did in the classroom. The first example is Dr. Norma Cantu, a good friend of mine, also from Laredo. And Norma um, uh, teaches English. She's been teaching English now for a long time. She holds an endowed chair at Trinity University in San Antonio. She's the author of the book Canicula, an autobiography featuring photographs of her childhood. Norma's work is, um, is one where she is conscious of the fact that many of the students in her classroom are first generation and low income. Some of these students have been told, you can't write. Some of these students have been invalidated and told, you don't belong here. They sometimes are afraid to come to college because they think that they don't really belong there. So what Norma Cantu knows is that she has to do more than just teach writing. She's got to find a way, a pedagogy, that connects these students to something deep about themselves so that they can awaken and say, aha, I can write, I can write. Uh, and so uh, here is uh, Dr. Cantu speaking about these photographs that she uses. And I was talking to faculty this morning in a workshop, and I was telling them about when I read Canicula, there was one photograph in particular that really caught my attention. And that was a photograph of her brother, Tino. Tino sat next to me in journalism class in high school. And Tino in that photograph that Norma uses is a young boy holding a rifle, about to shoot. And Tino is also the first person from Laredo to be killed in the Vietnam War. And so the irony is that here he is as a young child holding this rifle, which would ultimately lead to his demise. And so Norma writes the story of Tino from that photograph of him holding that rifle. She employs this strategy into her own teachings in her English course to really help students to not only write, but to connect writing to who they are, to give them voice, to give them an opportunity to show their strengths, which are in here, but they just need to be unleashed. So here is Norma Cantu. Bit more volume, please. of themselves as children and write about it. And uh, I'm teaching description and commas, co uh, sentence combining and all this stuff. But I have them do these um, guided imagery exercises and they write. And one student was writing it and it gets very emotional because it's about themselves and their families and all that. But I, I, I guide them. You know, we start with things that are more innocuous until we get to something that's more personal. And, you know, they wrote it and went home. They take it home. They read it in their small groups. They take it home, revise, edit, and then turn it in for me to grade. And this one student came back and she was, her eyes were puffy and she said, I cried all night. She says, you have helped me to know my mother. How? <laughs> I had asked them to write and she went and, and she the picture she remembered was of her mom and her she with her kid her siblings are all huddled around her mother. And so she wrote about that picture and then she started talking to the mother and 
So no durmió. She was up working on that paper you know, all night and came back the next morning and, and told me this and, and was so grateful. I didn't, I can't say that I, I can't take credit and say I did it. I allowed it to happen. And I, those are the kinds of moments. I mean, this is just one example of how something worked. So here's another example um, that, you know, faculty could use. And this is the example of slam poetry or spoken word. I came across a phenomenal documentary called Louder Than a Bomb. How many of you have seen that? Nobody here. I really highly recommend that you see it. It basically depicts the world's largest youth poetry slam. It's held in Chicago. And basically, young individuals present their poetry that they have written. This poetry is strong. It is raw. It is connected to these students' experiences in life. And some of it has been really tough. But yet, here they are, not only having written the poem. And again, remember, some of these students have been told that they cannot write. They've written these poems, and on top of that, they perform the poem in front of an audience. So I wanted to give you an example of what I mean. Um, I was particularly impressed with this young lady. Her name is Nova, and she writes about her experiences living with her father, where she basically became the head of the household because her father was an addict. And with her was her younger brother who suffered from diabetes. And so Nova writes and performs the poem, Apartment on Austin. My father grew up in a neighborhood where he got it bad from both sides, black people, white people, just because he was mixed. And as a result, because he grew up fighting, he grew up aggressive. And as a father, he was aggressive. When my parents got divorced, we thought that we didn't have to see him anymore. It turned out that we had to go there four out of seven days of the week. There are always sirens outside your place. Your condo always seemed to lean to the left. The cement windows rusted like overused water pipes. We lived on the first floor. What she writes about is hardcore, raw stuff. And when she says it, she gets in that place. So when she's on stage, you're, you're there with her. Our condo door was tainted white, like a three-year-old sock washed every week. The walls were the 49ers, and the carpet was rough like tangled hair. Everything you had no room for piled onto shelf like children. I fell into the caregiver role. I took care of him. I braided his hair before he went to work. I ironed his clothes. I woke him up before he went to work. You would always ask me to make your drinks. Measure liquid with the width of my nine-year-old fingers, four-finger sangria, two gin, two tonic, and one lemon juice. Well, I grew older, and I said, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I left. By the time I was 10, I was your wife, your sister, your mother, your best friend, and you were bitter. I would feed you chicken soup when you were sick, kiss your forehead to see how bad your fever was. But I'm 17 now and we don't even talk. And sometimes I wish I could tell you how much I miss you, how I want to wrap my arms around your sunken stomach like tissue paper, that I love you. Wish that you were here to be my Papa G again, so you would know that I have a boyfriend that loves me more than you ever used to. But I guess you're too busy rusting like cement windows to notice that your baby girl is a woman and how my memory will fade like your four-finger sangria, two gin, two tonic, and one lemon juice. My father and I haven't spoken since I was 12. And I feel like I've been trying so hard to just get rid of his memory. I just don't want to think about it anymore.
bunch of them. With a clicker. Tech help, please. All right. Um, so basically, if we break down these examples into this framework that I talked about, um, we begin with the, the pedagogic philosophy, the theoretical framework. Uh, here, I would characterize it as a liberatory sort of pedagogy, where the purpose is to liberate low-income students from self-limiting beliefs that they can't thrive, that they can't do this. Um, and another for Cantu is Chicana feminisms. The learning objectives would be to engage students in deep learning, to engage them in developing reading and writing proficiency, and to assist students to find their own voice. And the tools and practices include, for example, the cultural autoethnographies that Norma Cantu used. You could do slam poetry, guided imagery, journaling. And then the outcomes would be the reading and writing proficiency, self-knowledge, a healing that takes place when this liberation also takes place, and allowing students to witness themselves as powerful learners. And of course, emancipation or liberatory feature of this. Let me give you another example. Um, Herman, J. Herman Blake, who teaches African-American history uh, he's retired now from Iowa State University. His contemplative tools include audio narratives, photos, music, and self-reflection. Dr. Blake is um, a phenomenal human being. He is the biographer of Huey Newton, the head of the Black Panthers. He was a provost at UC Riverside, president of Tougaloo College, vice president at IUPUI, um, and um, is now in South Carolina, uh, living off the island of St. John and doing research on, um, on the Gullah. And um, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, he's one of the people that I interviewed, and I asked him, uh, Herman, what do you do with your students? How do you engage them in these deep, reflective learning experiences? So here's Dr. Blake's reply. I use in the class some of my own material, my own research. I have them listen to, for example, when I talk about slavery, I have them listen to an interview done in 1968 with a woman whose mother was a breeder. And it was her mother's job to have babies. And this woman talks. She was the 15th child of this woman born just after peace declared, as she put it. She was, I think, 94, 98, or something like this. And I have a picture of her, which I show, along with the transcript. I want to tell you, you can't hear that and walk away without thinking. When I get to talking about terrorism and violence, I use about six or seven slides from that book, Without Sanctuary. And I raised two questions. Why do they lynch people? And then I showed the pictures of the crowds who came to enjoy the spectacle, including young children. And one student wrote an essay saying, this course is not only about learning. This course is about thinking. And you think all the time. I use music because the music was used by the people to illustrate these points. So when they hear this woman whose mother was a breeder, I play for them the spiritual, Lord, how come me here? I wish I never was born. When they see those slides about how people have been misused and mistreated, I had them listen to Nina Simone singing strange fruit. I just gave a lecture on the civil rights movement 
and at the beginning of the 20th century, I had them listen to spiritual, Lord, I couldn't hear nobody pray, talking about the loneliness. So just to break down what Dr. Blake does, I would characterize his teaching and learning as a liberatory pedagogy or anti-oppression. You see that he has um, objectives that are both related to intellectual development, setting very high standards of learning for students. His pedagogic practices, um, he really includes uh, some very interesting work with the use of music and photos. And I have looked at the book Without Sanctuary, a very powerful book, and um, it's connected to that new museum in Alabama uh, that um, really portrays the horrific acts of violence against African Americans. Um, and the outcomes of empowerment, for example, and knowledge of self and others, and knowledge about, of course, African American history, understanding power dynamics, and then helping these students to see how they can be involved with social change. Uh, another example is Dr. Alberto Pulido, who teaches ethnic studies and sociology at the University of San Diego. And he's got a really great project that I've used in my own classrooms called uh, the Cajita Project. It's an arts-based project. And he also has another activity that he does, and that, that is visits to sites where social justice themes are highlighted. Um, so Dr. Pulido, especially at this time of the year where we're about to celebrate on November 2nd, Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. You saw that featured in the film Coco. Uh, where we honor uh, those that have gone before us, our ancestors. And the cemeteries are full of flowers during this time. Uh, and so what Dr. Pulido does is he has his students construct what he calls cajitas, which literally translate to a small box. But these boxes can be constructed in many different ways. But he asks these students to form a box of their own configuration, and write about someone in their family that has passed on and the impact of that family member on them. Connect that to the history of Dia de los Muertos in the Latino community. So here's, um, here's Dr. Pulido talking about one particular cajita that a student um, submitted. So this box here was done by um, a student named Valerie Barra. And um, the title you can see on the top sheet, I, I usually ask students to write like a narrative, which the students here today did a great job in. And it's called My Life as a Mestiza, Valerie Parra. And um, the little that I know about it, the, the, the discussions that we had about it, was that, um, was that she is part, she considers herself part Chicana and part Apache. And so when you look at the imagery in terms of the symbols, you see some of the traditional symbols that you would see in terms of being Mexicana or Chicana. And, and that whole process. But then you see some of the Native American influence. And she does, she did all these kind of different symbols around here. You can see, you know, Christian symbols and Native American symbols. Um, up on top, which you can't get access to, there's an actual um, field of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a agricultural field. There's an eagle that's been carved in. There's a horse. There's some Native American symbols as well. And um, I think it just captures what what the students were talking about in terms of those dualities and living in those multiple worlds. And I, as I mentioned, I've used the Cajita project in, in my own uh, class. Uh, and um, I, I've had very good success with that. I teach courses on, uh, with, with uh, masters and doctoral students who are going to go on and be student affairs administrators. And I ask them to work on a Cajita that displays some of their talents, the gifts that they bring to the student affairs profession, how they hope to make an impact, what has influenced them to be a student affairs professional. Because I wanted them to think more deeply about their role in working with students. It's not just about those students out there, but it's really who you are and what you bring and what you care about and how you're gonna work with these students. 
and so here you see a little bit about how I would characterize um, Dr. Pulido's work, which is anti-oppression, it's liberatory, and you see some of the student outcomes uh, about learning community history, politics, culture, empowerment, self-knowledge, et cetera. Um, so this brings me then to my book, Contemplative, uh, on Contemplative Education. Um, basically, you're going to hear different terms with the contemplative education movement that include contemplative pedagogy, deep learning experiences, holistic education, and I call what I do sentipensante, or sensing, thinking, pedagogy. It is a deep learning experience that's holistic. It includes the rigorous academics. We never want to sacrifice that. It includes culturally validating contemplative practices. It has a justice and equity foundation. It considers culturally diverse learning communities, and it fosters conocimiento. Now, to do this kind of work, we need to prepare. We need a personal contemplative practice, for example. If we're going to ask students to do this kind of reflection, then we need to have a practice of our own. Uh, in my own case, uh, I have studied transcendental meditation. I also do prayer. I do moments of silence. This is what I do in my, my own time. Um, I read um, uh, books that um, uh, have to do with uh, self-transformation. Uh, some of the books that I really have found helpful are those written by Mark Nepo, who happens to have written the foreword for my book. And um, I really, really admire you know, his work. Um, so having that personal contemplative practice is very important. A social justice orientation would also be helpful and an understanding of these diverse students, that not everybody is starting at the same starting line, that there are individuals who are coming from contexts where no one they know has been to college, where no one is available to help them with their questions at home, because nobody knows anything about higher ed. And so we need to have that compassion and that empathy for students who are different, but yet have hopes and dreams, but don't really know how to realize them. And it's our role to bring them in and to have faith that they too can learn, that they too can move forward and finish a college education. And so we also need a deep understanding of what is meant by contemplative pedagogy and how to engage it. And that would involve professional development. So here are some other examples. There are many, and I'm glad that Catherine is here because she's written three books about contemplative practices. And um, so you have a very good resource right here on campus. I was pleased to write the foreword to each of these three books. And I don't know how many, how many contemplative practices are there, Catherine? I mean, there's so many, at least 100, if not more, that you can choose from. And you can probably create your own. But from autoethnographies to contemplative photography to arts-based projects to slam poetry to service learning with a reflective component, meditative experiences, I mean, there's so many that you can choose. But again, the preparation to do this kind of work is really important because if this is done in the wrong way, it can actually create harm. And so, in my book, I kind of take people step by step with regard to what needs to be done to engage this sort of work. So some people ask me, where did you get the word sentipensante? You know, how did you come across this term? And um, when I was writing sentipensante pedagogy, I would ask these faculty members that I interviewed, what do you call this kind of teaching and learning. And they would say, we don't know, we don't have a name for it. This, this is just what we believe in. This is just my nature to teach in this way. And so for a while I thought, maybe I don't need to call it anything. 
But then a student from UCLA came to my office and she said, you need to read Eduardo Galeano's book of embraces. You'll probably find the word there. And so I came this, across this beautiful passage called The Celebration of the Marriage of Heart and Mind. Why does one write if not to put one's pieces together? From the moment that we enter school or church, education chops us into pieces. It teaches us to divorce soul from body and mind from heart. The fishermen of the Colombian coast must be learned doctors of ethics and morality, for they invented the word sentipensante, senti pensante, feeling, thinking, to define a language that speaks the truth. And so there was my word, a blend between two Spanish words, sentir, sensing, and pensar, thinking. And that finding that balance, finding that connection, finding that complementarity between these two processes of feeling and thinking is the beauty of teaching and learning in a transformative classroom. Uh, so, I decided senti pensante is my, my term. This is a, a word, despierta, wake up. Um, this was found in a wall in, in Peru. And it speaks to what some folks are calling stay woke. Um, and basically it's calling for us that amidst this chaos and the troubles that we find in our world, that we need to stay woke, despertar, to be awakened. We need to awaken from this collective trance that works against unity, that works against justice and equity and fairness, especially for the most vulnerable amongst us. And so, I ask us to stay woke, for example, to the architectural violence of the border wall, to the violence against immigrants and young children who often wake up in cages in South Texas, to wake up, stay woke to the violence against people of color, to the violence against women, to religious intolerance, and to the deficit thinking that permeates the academy about students of color, and to awaken, despertar, wake up, stay woke from the collective trance that affirms some of the myths and hegemonic perspectives that are entrenched in the academy. The notion that the mind is the only thing that's important, the privileging of Western ways of knowing, the whole idea that some people believe that inner skill development has no place in the classroom and that quantitative research is superior to qualitative research. Those are dualities that actually break us up more than connect us. So we need to stay woke, stay woke to all of the things that work against who we are as human beings. Our natural rhythm is to be at peace. Our natural rhythm is to be compassionate. It's not, the rhythm is not to be tense and angry. The rhythm is peace, unity, and compassion. So stay woke, despierta. Thank you so much for inviting me to vote, and it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for questions. This is being live streamed though, so if people wanna ask a question, please use the mics. So thank you for your presentation. I was struck by what, uh, I believe it was Norma 
Khan Tu mm -hmm. said about the, the assignment she gave, she said, I can't take credit for it. If anything, I just allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. I sort of provided the space for it to happen. So have you found that that's difficult for faculty to kind of grapple with um, <laughs> creating open-ended assignments? Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. Right, right, and that I think that's a that's a very important moment that that she talks about. That all of a sudden these things happen, and they happen in our classrooms all the time. Sometimes we go in there saying this is the way it's going to happen, but then all of a sudden something else shows up, and sometimes it's better than what we thought. But this is part of being a contemplative educator to stay open. If you don't like openness, if you want to be rather rigid and controlling and I can't deviate from this because I'm not going to cover this, I can't allow this, then maybe this isn't for you. You know, it's just like lecture isn't for everybody. You know, uh, collaborative learning is not for everybody. This is about a pedagogy that is going to take more time because it's going to ask us to th for us to even think more deeply about what we do as faculty and what we want our students to learn. So this, this requires preparation. And like I say in my book, it's best not to do it if you're going to do it wrong because that can create harm. And we don't want that. Hi, thank you for that. I'm Karen Topp. I teach in the physics department. I am just I'm processing what possible things I could do in my intro <laughs> physics class. And I'm just wondering, I meant, uh, Katie mentioned in the intro that you had some experience with STEM education. So I would love to hear if you have experience or ideas for ways of doing this sort of holistic education within the context of an introductory STEM class? There was a time in my life where I was going to be a scientist, okay? So there's a little bit of me left in me about that. I went a different direction. But I've always found science to be um, just a space of awe uh, and discovery and uh, openness. Um, and one of the things that I've learned about students, one of the studies I'm doing right now is Latinas in STEM education. Um, and we have learned that one of the things that helped these students to finish their STEM degree uh, was a strength that we call giving back. Um, basically, they're not looking for simply a degree to hang on the wall. They want to figure out how it is that being a STEM professional can make a difference in the world. How do you improve climate change? How do you reduce pollution? How do we clean up our waters? Uh, and so knowing that that strength is there is important for a faculty member because we need to leverage that strength. I'm not a physicist, but hey, you know, I mean, it, 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 I can't give you a specific example right now, only to tell you that I would say that scientists, um, many of them, do want to give back. And so what kind of project could you develop to engage the students in the community, to interview people, uh, to figure out how a phenomenon is affecting a community in positive and negative ways. I think those would be some sorts of um, reflective learning projects that you might think about in physics. Hi there. Um, I teach at the University of Southern Maine. Um, just down the road a little bit. Oh, well, thank you for coming all yeah, the way here. I'm really glad to be here. <laughs> Um, and you talked about the theoretical anchors that students uh, students need. Um, I wondered if you could explain a little bit more about what what the theoretical anchors are, how you how you work those into your experiences with students, um, well, and we, the roles they play. You mean the in the framework, the theoretical anchors that we're yeah. talking about? Yeah. Uh, basically, it what I'm saying there is that every faculty member has a theoretical lens that you know, we enter the classroom with, with this theoretical lens. 
And if, if you haven't figured it out, try to figure it out. What, what is it that you're doing? Uh, and, and what work uh, is grounding your, your, your beliefs? Um, and I think that that's, that's an important part that often we don't pay attention to. But often when we are, we are asked to submit our papers for promotion and tenure, we're asked about this. And so we have to sit back and say, OK, well, what is it that is framing my work? Uh, and so I can only tell you what frames my work, but you're the only one to decide what would frame yours. I just gave some examples. It's not a complete list. There's, you know, there, you know, there, there, are, there are other frameworks that you could employ, depending on your nature and what's important to you. Thank you again for everything. Um, I'm from Colby College, actually. So oh, well, thank you for joining. How far away is that? Uh, about an hour. Not Ooh, OK, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued by the thinking, not learning comment that um, was presented by one of your interviewees. And thinking about if a faculty member embraces that is one thing. But getting students, especially students that may not be in a world that's as racially diverse or even culturally diverse as the worlds that you live in, to, to grapple with the notion that their education should provide them with ways of thinking instead of actual knowledge, mm -hmm. um, I think is something that also makes it difficult for faculty, maybe in some disciplines more than others, to take that kind of journey that would bring them to a place where they're going to do this kind of teaching because the students aren't embracing this new, this brave new world of teaching. And mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak a bit about student resistance to this? Uh, yes. Um, well, first of all, students have been socialized in a particular paradigm. So when you introduce this, not everybody's going to be receptive, OK? It's just like not all faculty will be receptive. What I do is I give students an option. When I assign the Cajita project, I say to the students at the very first week, if you do not feel comfortable doing this, I'm not going to force you to do it see me and we're going to have another assignment. And I also want to recognize that while some communities are not as diverse as others, what we're saying here is that in a transformative experience, it's not teaching and learning for you know, New Brunswick, it's teaching and learning for the world. These students are gonna go out, you know, most of them. And they're going to encounter a lot of diversity. And they're going to encounter a lot of different perspectives. And so for me, anyway, the best education is to help them to come to terms with these diverse perspectives, to engage with different people, uh, and to challenge some of their belief systems along the way. Um, and that goes for everyone. So um, that's basically where I'm coming from with, with this work. So how many of you came from half an hour, an hour away? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for your presence here. And those who are watching online, please join me in thanking Dr. Thank you. Gracias.